Well, if you're visiting Canterbury Gardens, welcome again. Uh, as you would have heard, I'm one of the pastors at Canterbury. Uh, my name is Shabu, uh, and you can chat to me later and come and say hello. That'd be really great. Last week, uh, as you know, or maybe you're hearing for the very first time, we as a church are exploring the book of Exodus. Uh, we are up to chapter 5 and 6, and last week we got to hear, or actually we got to meet the God of the Bible. Uh, we got to be introduced to him, in particular as Moses was introduced to him. Also, we heard of the calling of Moses, and we also heard of the mission of Moses, and then finally we heard this beautiful reaction in the deserts of um, Egypt as they worshipped God. That's how the chapter finished. This morning, friends, what I want us to consider is this, the promise-keeping deliverer, the promise-keeping deliverer. Would you join with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we come before your throne of grace this morning, and we ask for the many voices and noises and distractions that cry into our hearts as we continue this time of worship under your word, would you change us? Lord, I ask that this morning for those whose hearts are hard towards you, soften them, please. For our hearts who are weary for the various things in our lives, comfort us and encourage us those of us who are any in between, may we walk away gazing at the great mighty God, the one who does keep his promises and who does deliver. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I said last week, we, we finished off in the la, um, chapter 4, and it, it's like a beautiful story, right? It's the, 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 the moment of finishing at a very high note. They're worshipping God. And now, <laughs> chapters 5 and 6, it's like life, reality check. So have a look with me again in verses 1 to 4 of chapter 5. After Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But but Pharaoh said, Who is this Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days, journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. The king of Egypt said to him, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. You know, it's interesting when you meet someone and you hear their name for the very first time or they introduce you to them and you hear a little bit about them, it changes how you react, right? Right? Uh, you know, if you knew and you met Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia, I would hope your, your reaction wouldn't be like, oh, g'day, mate, how are you going? Like, it might be a little bit different because you know who he is. A few years back, um, my wife and I had the great privilege to go to a birthday party, a friend of hers from high school. And as I walked into this house, I noticed something really amazing. On one hand, as I walked in, there's this pool, there's this massive hawk hanging over the pool like this sculpture, and I thought, wow, that's amazing, that's a bit weird, but amazing. I went into the lounge room, and I noticed there's all this Hawthorne memorabilia everywhere. For those of you who don't know, I'm a Hawthorne supporter. If that makes you lament, we've got a prayer ministry for you afterwards. Um, (laughs) As I walked in the lounge room, all this Hawthorne memorabilia is everywhere, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is amazing. This guy must go for Hawthorne. So I met the owner of the house, and I said to him, oh, g'day, how are you going? Did you go for Hawthorne? He goes, "Mm mm-hmm. Okay, so I said, oh, yeah, I've been barracking for Hawthorne since 1988 when we migrated to Australia and like all this kind of stuff I'm kind of talking to them about. And the guy's going, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, great. I said, how long have you been barracking for Hawthorne? Yeah, for a while. Hmm. This is so weird. And then people around me looking and going, why is this guy asking so many questions? I'm just trying to engage with him because he's a Hawthorne supporter, I'm a Hawthorne supporter. It didn't go anywhere. It was really awkward. And then I thought, this is so weird. So I get back in the car, we're heading home, and then my wife proceeds to tell me we were in the house of a player of Hawthorne whose father I was talking to. 
And I remember thinking to myself, if I had that information earlier, <laughs> I would not be talking the way I was. He'd probably be like, what is wrong with this guy? I haven't been invited again to their house. <laughs> and that's an illustration to point out, to hear what's going on as Pharaoh asks some questions. Right? In this moment, Moses comes to Pharaoh and he gets an audience with Pharaoh. Now, there's a lot of commentary around this. If you're into the history of it, maybe uh, that was part of the tradition. A king would allow people to come and have an audience with them. Or maybe because of Moses and who he is and his background, maybe there's some connections there. Either way, he gets an audience of the king of Egypt. And in this moment, there's sort of a tone going on. There's a communication that's about to begin that changes, not changes, that directs us to unpack what's going to unravel for us the story of uh, Exodus. Moses comes and communicates, and he says to them, Pharaoh, I have a message for you. I have a message from the God of Israel. Now, did you pick it up in the verses? Who does Moses say? Who do you have to release? Whose people? It's not Moses' people. It's not Pharaoh's. It's whose? God's people. Now, I want you to understand the tone in this passage is not like a request. Uh, and this tone is uh, a better way to say is to say, Moses is saying to Pharaoh, listen, Pharaoh, you have no longer power or influence over this people. They belong to the God of the Bible. And what I'm asking right now is not a request, it's really a demand to say, would you please release this people at least for three days so they can go worship their God. Now remember the story, right? We've heard God's already said, I'm going to take the people away from Egypt This is a test from God to Pharaoh to reveal what's going on underneath in his heart. Now, his response. What's his response? We see that in the passage. You know, it would be great if he said, oh, sounds good. Look, I'm a pretty good boss. It's a three-day weekend. Why don't I give them some time off so they can go worship their God? Did you see his response? He says, who is the Lord? Another way to say, who is this Lord? Who is this Yahweh that you speak of? that I should obey his voice? I don't know this Lord, this Yahweh. I won't let them go. Now remember, as we talked about it last week, this language of Yahweh is a pretty uh, significant nickname of God's in the Old Testament. It means Yahweh is used to describe the true creator God. And in your English translation, you will see bold letters or uh, capital letters to indicate that. The tone is, from Pharaoh back to Moses, oh, sorry, this is not a tone of, oh, I want to explore who this God is, I really want to know, I've heard about him. No, the tone is, I don't care. I don't care who he is. Who's this person anyway? And the text and language is the tone, there's a sarcasm and and maybe even an apathy to this. He's actually not asking for information of who is this Lord. Rather, he's thinking, Yahweh, the God of Israel, he's nothing. He's nothing to me. Moses tries to negotiate and wants to clarify some things, but nothing. It falls on deaf ears and more. What's going on is it falls on a deaf heart, a hardened heart. See, what's going on here is displaying in his very response that Pharaoh does not think much about the God of the Bible, the God of Israel. And so he zeroes in and says to Moses, listen, there's many more. And the language is like the the people of Israel have become so big, they're more than the Egyptians. So I'm not going to let them go. They're actually mine. They don't belong to your God. And it sounds like if you guys are asking for a three-day weekend of going away to worship your God, well, guess what? It sounds like you probably don't have much to do. Worship God? Yeah, right, as if you're going to do that. So, communication is sent out to the various supervisors, management teams, to display an utter cruelty and evil that lays in the heart of Pharaoh. And he lays on them heavier work. 
a burden, no straw to build for them. The workload does not change, and so Pharaoh makes it so hard for them. And now remember, in this culture, they would have had supervisors like what's described here. These are sort of the people who enforce their their own people to do the dirty work. And they're told, this is what you must do. And they go and tell their people, and they realize this is going to be an impossible task. It's unfair. It's hard. Now, the supervisors, in some sense, come to Pharaoh. They're the people who have been put in charge. Uh, It's using our language. I thought it's like having a union meeting, you know, with the CEO of the corporation. They call and say, come on. This is a bit unfair. Your servants, did you pick that up the language? Whose servants? Your servants have no straw. Your servants are beaten. They make an appeal to Pharaoh. But friends, we know as we've been exploring Exodus, who has already heard their cry of injustice? The Lord has. Who describes Israel as his son, his child. The Lord does. It's a picture of saying right now, they don't actually cry out to the Lord, they rather go to Pharaoh. See, to this king, Pharaoh, the people are nothing but a commodity to be used and abused and kept under control for his own gain. The people of Israel become his very object of anger and frustration But what's going on here is unveiling for us the reality of his unbelief, the Pharaoh's unbelief in the God of the Bible. And the language is interesting because it starts to say, he says, they're all idle. Another way of saying is they're slackers, slackers. He repeats it a couple of times. They want to go and worship. They're not going to worship. They've got nothing else to do. So I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to solve this. I'm going to make their work really hard. So their appeal, this time, falls on deaf ears. And this heart is bent on taking on actions to display his very unbelief in the God of the Bible. So which leads them, now as they come out, they meet Moses and Aaron, and their accusation to them is to say, hey, what have you guys done? The Lord be your judge. You're responsible for this. We're done. We're not going to survive this. There's two reactions going on here. But then we see Moses. Where does he turn to? Who does he go to? The Lord. And he comes with a question, Lord, why have you done evil to your people? Why did you send me to do this if this was going to be the reaction? I told you this was going to happen. I mean, if you had delivered it, like you said you would, we wouldn't be in this trouble. And now what we're seeing, friends, is three responses in the passage in front of us. There's the response of Pharaoh saying, who is this God? Yeah, right. Then you've got the people who are saying to Moses, look what you've done. And you've got Moses who says, Lord, what have you done? I think what it does in this passage, it beautifully captures for us Reality of life on this side of heaven. See, on one hand, you've got people like Pharaoh actually are still around in our world. Actually, maybe even here, maybe in this church, or maybe even in our very state. The posture is God. God of the Bible? Yeah, right. What God are you talking about? You're telling me there's this God who tells me how I should live my life. Are you for real? Who does he think he is? This is then displayed in their very life and life choices and lifestyle that ultimately is saying, I am God. They may not say it outwardly, sometimes they might, but it is displayed in their very life. It's like um, I'm my own boss mentality. It's a posture that says, I don't know this Christian God of the Bible. I don't believe in this Christian God of the Bible. So I will do and I will determine life in itself. 
And friends, we see that in our culture, in Melbourne itself, in Victoria itself. Who are you, God of the Bible, to define what is sex and sexuality? Who are you, God of the Bible, defines when one must live and when one must die? I choose, we will choose, we will put legislation into that. Who are you in your work culture to say that you believe in this God of the Bible? Let me just say to you, you work for me. I own you, I pay you. So if that means I ask you to lie or cheat, even though you believe in this God of the Bible, you belong to me. It's this ugly picture of someone who's arrogantly beating their chest and says to God, who do you think you are to tell me how I should live my life? Friends, that happens even in church world, in church culture. It's not out there. It happens in our very world here. How many of us know there are those of our friends and family members who have been surrounded with Christian witness over and over again? And there's a posture that says, so? And so what is our response? See, what happens is when you and I grow in a reverence of who God is and the God of the Bible... It will be displayed, and it should be displayed in the way we live. And this is why what happens throughout history, it's nothing new. It didn't happen just in Exodus. continues that when a nation or a ruler sees that the God of the Bible is of no reference, no reverence, no existence, does not have all of him, often it's the believers who will bear the brunt of their attacks in various ways. And you might be facing that right now, at school, friends who say, you believe in the God of the Bible? Are you serious? At uni, where the option is not there to discuss, it's pretty much told that this God that describes himself as the creator of the universe, that's the joke. Your workmates or your boss, or the very client, or the very organization that you work for that do not believe in this God of the Bible, and their response and actions often feel and sense that you're being attacked because of your faith. See, what Pharaoh thinks, and often those of us who see this, uh, it's a proud heart, it's pride, that thinks that the God of the Bible is a joke. But what they don't see is this, friends, that their pride blinds them to the fact, and their sin blinds them to the fact, they're actually not fighting against you, me, Christianity. They're actually drawing the battle lines against the God of the universe, the one true God. And dear friend, Maybe you're feeling that right now in whatever context you're in. The question you and I have, if we're feeling that and sensing that, experiencing that, who will we go to to cry out for deliverance? The foreman went to Pharaoh. They blamed Moses and Aaron. Where does Moses go? He knows who's sovereignly in control in this situation. He goes to God. And he cries out to God. And you have Pharaoh saying, who is this God? And you have Moses saying, God, why are you letting this bad thing happen to your people? See, in all of this, we should not be surprised by Pharaoh's response. We've already been told about that in Exodus, right? God already said, look, this is what's going to happen. I'm God who knows all, and this is what Pharaoh's going to do. It should be expected. I mean, the very earlier chapter... The very people who are in the desert sands worshipping God are now going, what have you done? You know, life is wonderful when it looks like all the things are going our way. God is wonderful and such a blessing when it feels like life is good. But when difficulty comes, what is our response? And the very response of the people here is, going to, is an echo of what will happen throughout Exodus. 
It's easy for you and I to praise God when things are going well. I do that. It's so hard to praise God when it feels like it's one thing after the other and the pressures around you are building. It feels as though the world itself is narrowing and they've got you in their sight. Friends, what is our response? See, more importantly, what's here is the invitation from God to all of us. Not to just praise God when all is good. The question is, will we say, it is well with my soul, even in the midst of hardship? When it feels as though God is not doing anything, we ought to be asking, God, are you in this? We, need, we, we have an invitation to come. And we might be even thinking, how can God bring good out of evil? Friends, he can, and he will, and history shows that. Dear friends, our very heart posture is often tempted to say, God, are you here? The culture in the world around us displays and says, God's not around, who cares? Yet our response is to remember. Remember the one who keeps his promises. Remember the one who is the deliverer. And so we come to Exodus 6, verses 1 to 8. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of this land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, the Lord, I do not make myself known to them. I established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and be with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, and you shall know I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land. I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. If you have a pen or highlighter, I would encourage you to circle and underline how many times God says, I will, and I am. You have Moses who comes, and what he's doing is he's complaining to God. And I love it. You know why I love it? We can come as God's people. Just like Moses with our complaints. Friends, it's a real wonderful reminder that Moses himself is not some perfect hero. Yes, he's chosen by God to be his servant, a mouthpiece, and he's playing in this context right now like a priestly kind of role on behalf of the people. What he sees is what he sees, and all he knows is all he knows, and so he complains to God. But it displays a beautiful relationship that he has with God. It's a reminder to you and I that for those of us who are his children... We can come to the God of the universe with our worries and concerns and, dare I say, complaints. But the invitation is not to stay there. Rather, to trust in the very character of who God is. That he is the promise-keeping deliverer. In Exodus 6, Moses and the people of Israel are given this wonderful reminder of what is important when we face these kind of moments in our faith journey, because we all will. Where We may ask, God, where are you? God reminds Moses again, one, Moses, guess what? This is part of my plan. And depending on your passage, it may say, God's saying to Moses, you will see what I will do. Either it reads as God's hand or Pharaoh's hand. What I don't want you to miss as you decide where you head to that to make this very clear. The point is, Moses, I will do this. Two, it's a reminder of who God is. 
He reminds Moses, I am the God of your fathers. And that language of them not knowing who this God is, like they did, like Abraham didn't know God, there's a word play going on here. It's like saying, Moses, they didn't fully understand, they didn't fully understand who I am. They didn't see me in all my fullness like you have. They are not, had not been able to see the very mighty act I'm about to do, this work of salvation and redeeming the people of Israel. They received my word by promise. They lived by faith, but now not only are the people going to live by faith, they will see live by sight. But the thing is, Moses, I will keep my promises. I will do it. Unlike Pharaoh, who is a cruel king, God is the great and mighty king who hears the cry of his people. The one who declares himself as the great I am, he is the deliverer of his people from heavy burdens and slavery. This is a reminder to Moses that God's plans will come to fruition. He will deliver his people. It's a reminder to Moses that God's purpose of fulfilling his promises will happen. Like he said, he said that he will bring the people to the land because he already promised and it will happen because he is the Lord. He keeps his word. He keeps his promises. Using biblical language, he keeps his covenant. It's a reminder that the God of the Bible is the God of redemption and rescue and will deliver his people. He always keeps his word. These are the truths, friends, that should be singing in your hearts and my hearts as we struggle in the various things in life. That our circumstances don't overwhelm us to the point that we forget of the truth of who God is and who he says, in particular by his word. Now, you would hope you would see revival part two, like they saw in the desert. What happens? God's people's response is very different now. Verse 9, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. Now, if you look at my hands uh, later on, if you want to shake my hand or look at them closely, uh, my tradie friends call them supple and soft. (laughs) The reason for that is I don't do hard work that often. I probably need to. There's no calluses in my hands. Now, if you work with your hands, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. There's a roughness there. Now, that's a really silly illustration, but I like that imagery, right? Imagery of this harshness or a hardness of the heart that's going on because of this constant sense that God is not acting. See, the very people here are tired. You've got to think about it. They've been slaving away. They don't want to listen anymore. They've heard this before. They don't want to listen to the promises. The very suffering and the very circumstances have triumphed over the very truth of who God is and who he says he is. And the language is that the brokenness or the shortness of their spirit. They're very discouraged. They're dispirited. They're weary. There's there's a frame of mind now where they're saying they don't actually want to listen to Moses because their very lives feels like totally the opposite. They have forgotten to listen and consider and rest and trust in God's truth as the one who is the God of the universe. Now, I don't know about you. I read these kind of Old Testament things and I sometimes shake my head. (sighs) People of Israel, seriously. I don't know... If I was really honest, I have had those moments. Have you? Though when those moments where you feel that perhaps in life, you won't say it verbally, yeah, right. Uh, maybe there's a part of you that says, oh, Lord, how long will you let this keep going? There's this sense of discouragement and brokenness, a sense of feeling like all hope is gone, because that very circumstance louder, seems louder and bigger than the God of the universe. The promises of God does not actually fill your heart with hope and trust. If that is you, 
The question still is, where will you go in that moment or that circumstance? More importantly, it's not about where you will go, who you will go to. So the people went to Pharaoh, not to God. The felt experience triumphed over the very truth of who God says he is and what he will do. And so maybe the invitation for you is to come to the Lord with your weary heart. So Moses is now told, they, to people who don't listen, are now told to go and tell Pharaoh. And I love Moses' response. I'm starting to really like this guy because he's like, uh, did you just notice what happened to the people? If they're not going to listen, why will Pharaoh listen? And like I told you, my ability to speak, uncircumcised lips, it, it's a, another way of saying, Lord, my lips are no use to you. Uncircumcision and language in the Old Testament is significant. Another way of saying is uncircumcised heart is like saying the the years will not listen to your word, your truth. And in this moment, we're seeing the heart of all of us. In Moses, Lord, is there another option? Is there another way? And there might be, but the Lord is saying, and the response to, from Moses and to Aaron is a wonderful reminder. The Lord is saying, the best thing to do right now in this moment is still to follow the voice and the word of the Lord. And what does he say to Moses and Aaron in verse 13? But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel, about a pharaoh, a king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. See, this moment for Moses and Aaron is that they hear from God, and God just literally is telling them, go, trust, take my word for it. No matter what the response is. See, here we have this wonderful moment of what it means to follow God. In that moment when you and I might say, Lord, are you sure about this? That moment, humanly speaking, things seem impossible. That moment, humanly speaking, it made me feel like this is pointless, God, to represent you in this moment. It's that moment we're all challenged to ask, in that moment, whom will we listen to? Whom will we follow? Whose truths and promises will we rest in? Whose faithfulness will fill our hearts? And so God reminds Moses who he is. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Joseph, and the God of Moses and Aaron. He says, go. I think it's a beautiful moment for us that we're able as his children to come with our fears, our doubts, our disheartened disheartened hearts, but not to stay there, but to move towards the one who knows every detail, to come and follow him, to follow the mission that is ahead of us. This is why I find it absolutely fascinating whenever I meet men and women who God has called into any kind of mission. And people say things like, are you serious that you're going to take you and your kids and your three little kids to some place across the globe? That doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? Why don't you become secure here first? Or in that moment in your profession at work where someone says to you, hey, listen, we've got this great contract for you. We've got this great um, uh, salary package to give you an extra raise to do more work. You know, this will really do really well for you. But you know, deep down in your heart, if I say yes to this, this will impact my walk with the Lord, how my involvement in my church, whatever it might look like, ultimately impact my walk with Jesus all around us. See, Moses and Aaron are given a task, and now we're given this list of names. Now, John asked me earlier, should I read through us? And I said, okay, it's fine, I'll explain it. But these are leaders, leaders of houses to whom they're given the task to speak to, to come and trust God. Now, I'm sure many of you when you read particularly Old Testament and genealogies, I'm sure you guys spend a lot of time reading it, highlighting it, and really interested in it. Wow, some people are, yes, great. Friends, it's a beautiful reminder to you and I. When genealogies come up in the Bible, they are the very words of God. There's a purpose in that as well. Names mean much. 
There's a purpose for it. See, what we're seeing is the family history of Moses and Aaron, and those who would actually deliver people out of, um, um, out of Egypt. We're seeing the very history of Aaron's sons, who would be called to be priests. And we're seeing others who will also fill roles, like the sons of Korah, but also they would become jealous of Aaron, and they would rebel. You've got Phineas, who would actually be faithful as Israel moves to worship Baal. We've got four generations mentioned here, including Moses and Aaron. It's a reminder to the people then and to us that the Lord is working in the very midst of people, both in their joy, in their victory, in their suffering, in their faithlessness and sin and faithfulness because of who he is. He's the great I am, the great I am who's faithful to his promises. The question is, will we believe him and take him at his word? We know this, right? And there might be here today. Many of you have grown up with the truth of who God is. You've heard it all. You know all the answers. You would probably even win a, a prize at a Bible quiz. But there's something going on in your heart right now. There's like a hardness in your heart. I want to invite you to consider something very seriously. What you're going against is not us. Not Canterbury Gardens Community Church. You are standing against the creator of the universe who rules and reigns. The one who is true, just, and holy. And I want to put some verses up here, what it means that your pride is leading to. Up here on the screen, if they're up here. From Psalm 138 says, For the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. That's the proud. Proverbs 3.34, to the scorners he's scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. Proverbs 29.23, once pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. And here are Jesus' words from Matthew 23, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 1, he, was brought down with, he has brought down the mighty from their throne and exalted those of humble state. Then James 4, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. If you are someone in proud in heart, my prayer is to you today, whether if you're listening in or in this seats here, that God would be gracious to your prideful heart and you will respond to him in humility. Followers of God, it's a reminder to us when we feel as though culture, friends, family are attacking our very belief system and worldview, step back, take a deep breath, and try not to take it personally. Remember who they're truly going against. In the midst of you crying out for God to bring justice, and you should and we should, maybe we should also cry out for mercy. Because everyone who believes in God is always sitting here because of his mercy towards you and I. And Christian friend, if you're in a season that your spirit is broken, it feels as though the very challenges and circumstances in your season is unending, please take those fears and doubts and concerns not to yourself, but to the one who keeps his promises. And you might be someone who's constantly fighting that sin, that besetting sin that feels like constantly getting victory over you. Can I encourage you to run to the one who calls himself your deliverer? The one who is the Lord, who does deliver. To remind it today, what we need to do is cling to the truth of who God says he is. As I mentioned to you earlier about genealogies, What genealogies do is they reveal the faithfulness of God in the midst of broken people. We heard that during communion focus as well. It's a live picture of those who have been faithful, those who have been faithless, but the one who is God. See, in the very genealogy here, what we hear and see is a whisper of God's grace. See, Aaron would marry a woman by the name of Elsheba, who was the daughter of Adminadab and the sister of Nashon, Now, these are significant names. You know why? They become the ancestors of King David. 
And so when you flick across to Matthew chapter 1, verse 4, their names come up in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is our true deliverer. The one who although has the power and authority to calm the storms, to raise the dead and heal, the one even the demons themselves say, we know who this is. The one who reigns was willing to come and enter into this world to rescue the enslaved, those who are enslaved in sin. Jesus Christ who would perform the ultimate, most glorious and powerful sign that he would die on the cross to hang there for your sin and my sin. And the very people, as they crucified him, do you remember what he said to them? The one who could call the angels to come and wipe out the universe turns around in Luke twenty-three thirty-four and says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Jesus displays in perfectly humility to rescue us from the true slavery of sin and death. And because he is God, on the third day he was raised again. And as the risen king, he's victorious, ruling and reigning. The one who is now the great high priest. The one to this day are calling many who are enslaved to him, the lost, to become his children. And for those of us who are his children, do you know what Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight? 28? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus not only has invited you to come to him, weary friend, that you can find rest. He offers you something that is beautifully light. Did you know that you and I, for those of us who know Christ, we have not only been saved from sin, but we and I have been saved for a purpose. God has chosen to, for you to live here in this time, in history, in Melbourne, in Victoria, for his purpose and glory, and maybe even around the world. That you and I are his tangible witness at home, at uni, at school, in the office, on that work site on Monday, in the community around us. So I invite the music team to come up. What I'm going to do now is invite you also to be still. I'm going to ask you to do some business with the Lord through his word. Firstly, when we all bow our heads, firstly, is there a sin or anything in your life right now that you need to confess to the Lord? Jesus says that he's faithful and just and he will forgive sin. Do you feel as though life in itself feels overwhelming and maybe you might not say it outwardly but in your heart you feel as the Lord has let you down? Be honest. Talk to him. Dear friend, he has not let you down. Christ is a reminder of that. Our God is the true and living God who has rescued and delivered us. He is the Lord to this day, as passages describe, he laughs at the kings of the world and authorities who are actually under the power and authority of Jesus. They will bow to him one day. For those of us who are his children, he's still the promise-keeping, beautiful, glorious God fully displayed in Christ. Our Savior to this day intercedes for you and I, dear friend, to live for him in this world, even in the midst of hostility, 
we are his. Lord God, creator of the universe, we bow at your feet. So as we sing this last song, may we rest in your grace, in your mighty name, amen.